Hi, and welcome to the Dark Web Vlogs, where I'm sharing the experiences I've had working with clients on some of the most outrageous deals being run over the dark web. The job I'll be talking about today was a request to stop an evil leader from making a drastic move that would target the religious powers that are their enemies and form partnerships with those deep in the occult and who worship Satan. And what makes this story different than so many fantastical stories you will hear about good versus evil is that this angel and demons account is real and almost came to fruition in your world. Knowing that time was running out, the good guys in this story are looking to me to help them stop an otherwise inevitable collapse and the defeat of life as we know it. They call me the ghost. I'm ex-CIA and now a dark operative on the dark web. I've worked a lot of jobs and today is my account of what happened when working down to the last minute, we almost lost our futures, our lives, and our souls. Take a listen and enjoy. This request came to me in the middle of the night, around 2 a.m., and I'm very rarely around when a request actually comes in, but I was there for this one. And I could have just waited until the morning to open it, but I decided to go into it and see what it was. So anyway, I'm in my place of business, I'm alone, and I'm just sitting there reading this request from a parapsychologist working on a project with a group at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Says they've cracked the code, figured it out, finally conquered the connection. They were ready to tap into the great minds that have come before us. But the information has been stolen by a group that got wind of what they were doing, and there was talk that they too wanted to connect. This group was led by someone that is connected to the Church of Satan. So this connection is them reaching out to the world of the afterlife, and then those that took the information also want to reach out, only they won't be looking for the intelligent or wise souls. They will be searching for the angel of darkness. Well, that said, of course, I want to meet this man and see what else he can tell me about all of this. And I bring Harley with me. She's my digger and excellent in finding pretty much anything on anyone. We get there and meet him. And this is the parapsychologist. And if you don't know, what they do is they study both the paranormal and psychic phenomena. Anyway, okay, let's call him Simon. He meets us just outside of University Hall there at Utrecht. We go in and he takes us back and down to some offices in a space that he's currently working in and he shuts the door. And Simon, you know, he's not walking around all nervous or anxious like some of the people do when I first meet them for a job. He was actually calm and very professional. His office was neat. He had this one plant. I remember sitting with this little plant light. There weren't any windows in those offices. And then he had a coat rack and books. He had lots of books. I swear he fit as many books as he could into that small space. He was taller and lean. He had white hair and really dark eyebrows and wore glasses. And he had a sweater with a jacket. I mean, this guy was the kind of person I could just tell that any other time, I would have been just fine sitting there and picking his brain for hours. But he had a problem, and that's why I was there. So he tells me more about his work. Yes, he's connected to the other side. There were a few of them on this project, actually. Limited budget. He tells me that they had been working on this since the conference at the university in 2008, and it took them years. But they got it. Excited? Yes. But for controlled and purposeful reasons. He explains that this is a project set up to help societies all over the globe to improve and fix some of the messes that have resulted from our actions over the years. You know, regain the insight of when things were simpler, get new perspectives on the progress we've made, things like that. But what was stolen was serious. It was the entire set of schematics for this very secret gateway device. And then he also gave me a USB that had files and information around the project on it, pieces of equipment to look for, things like that. And he also gives me a picture of the device, well, the outside of it. 
It was a silver box door. It kind of reminded me actually of one of those doors you'd see in a morgue where they keep the bodies. Didn't look like much, but according to Simon, all the magic happens behind that door. And then he goes on to tell me more about this group that took everything. The job was led by an ex fourth degree member of the Church of Satan. Having gone his own way, this member left the church. Not really on bad terms or anything, but he wanted to start his own group, a group that put the devil on a pedestal. Still embracing individualism and ego, they were a group that felt the devil would only free them to be more of what they wanted. And to each his own. Either way, these are the people who carried out this robbery. Now, as Simon and his group were working on their own project, over time, things would, you know, pop up on their radar. People wanting to snoop and find out what they're up to. Everyone on their team was known for their work and their knowledge. It was becoming clear that they had something personal or private or bigger that they were working on. And most of it, it seemed, was easy enough to keep at bay. I mean, they even had a priest on their team, which actually helped because there would be a number of religious leaders against what they were doing. And I mean, this is how it goes with this stuff. You have the people working on it, and they're totally excited about it. But opening a door like this just by default would be hard to control. And the risks of letting in the wrong thing, they're always there. According to Simon, however, they had it under control. He tells me they are confident they can control this. But there's only one way to do that. This gateway has to be tended to by certain people. Every time the door is to be opened. So according to Simon, the people you need and the people who they have on their team include a priest, as I mentioned, and it's not just any priest. It has to be a priest who has been trained and has the permission to conduct exorcisms. He's there to basically conduct a full exorcism on the doorway the entire time it's open. And then you have the physicist. They're there to watch over and keep control over the energy gravity, light and time, things like that. They can also monitor the flow of what's coming in and also control what they're willing to accept. His tweaks also help them connect with better precision to specific dates and times of certain people's passings. You have the professor. He was how they acquired the use of the university and that whole connection and support. And he would also be the one to document and record all findings and research in a way that could be useful later. And he would also be used to help introduce the whole thing to the world someday. You have the parapsychologist. Parapsychologists work to prove if the paranormal exists by trying to prove it doesn't and that instead there's a scientific explanation. So in this case, he's there to help them determine if what's coming over is real in the first place. And then finally, they have the medium. And she's there to read the spirit feel their intentions, and if they bring a specific message, things like that. So you can see that this is very complex and has a lot of pieces to it. It's not like you can just flip a switch and turn this thing on to welcome flying ghosts that come across. You need to be careful and make sure you know what's coming over. You know, let's say we have, in simple terms, the good and the bad spirits. So the good spirits come over much more peacefully, and they're cautious Bad spirits, however, they can't get through fast enough. They're aggressive, they're in a hurry, and they're loud. Now, with our new and evil leader, and I'll call him Luther, well, Simon and friends know that Luther started focusing on what they were doing a few years after that last conference. He had a whole team dedicated to it for a while. They knew Luther had a house in Utrecht and a large apartment in Manchester, England. And then on top of that apartment there, where he and some of his people would stay when they were in town. He also owns a shop there. It's a rare bookstore. And since Simon's team, you know, doesn't have a special group just to follow people around, that was really about it. Aside from his work on the dark side, they haven't really been able to figure out exactly what all he does. They did notice that shortly after the robbery, Luther's travels to England picked up a bit. That robbery was discovered on a Saturday morning when Simon's team was getting ready to meet. They found it all, the signs of the break-in. There were two hard drives missing. Entire file cabinets were gone. And included in all of that was the information about the gateway, everything they needed. 
and then burnt into the wall as if branded was the pentacle, inverted. And that was Luther's famous leave behind in all of his jobs and tricks. And now this man had it all. The only save here was that Luther didn't find the actual gateway set up. Simon said that was put together in a private lab secured by the physicist. Either way, with the information Luther now had, he too could build a gateway. He was no longer just a bother. From that point forward, he could and should only be considered extremely dangerous. This robbery happened earlier that summer, and they tried different things. For instance, they tried to report it to the police. But that process proved to be a dead end for everyone. That option ended during their first meeting at the police station. I mean, Simon side couldn't explain what exactly they were doing in that lab or why they were certain it was Luther. This could kill any support from the university, not to mention their donors and religious connections. Everyone would run as far away from all of this as they could and deny everything. And Luther, well, he had enough going on to cover himself, and with his doings and connections, he wasn't really the ideal person to investigate in the first place. And that was that on that idea. And since then, you know, Luther made it seem like he took those things for money, saying he wanted to partner with the super team and all this other stuff. Confused and scared about where this all was going, they decided to call in some help they could trust and under the radar. They were certain he was playing games with them and knowing this could get very dangerous. And that's why they got a hold of me, to get to the bottom of it all. Now, they were certain that Luther always knows more than you think. And Simon tells me in a very serious tone that he cannot be underestimated. And I mean, for the super team, it took years to build what they had. But those years included all the trials and errors and extensive research and testing. Luther didn't need any of that because now he had the end result. He had the instructions, parts, tools to put this thing together. And we had to remember that because Luther had watched that team so closely for a while, no one could really be sure how much they knew already before the robbery even took place. Point being, even though the robbery happened more recently, it doesn't mean Luther couldn't build this thing fast. And so this is where they are, and they called on me. Harley and I are listening to this. You know, we just exchange glances. It's a lot to take in, and it could be a lot to deal with. I mean, wow, here we are. I have this super team of researchers who want to change the world. And then I have the evil team of destroyers who want to take over everyone on their own planet. This job would be to track down Luther and his people and find out how far along they are from creating their own doorway, assuming that they're not done with it already by some miracle, and then get it all back and destroy any other means of access they have to any of this. This job involves spirits traveling and communicating, the hunting down of evil any piece of reference to this device. It's mystical and scientific with heavy religious undertones. Of course I want in. I somehow, you know, just can't walk away from something that, if not done and completed, could literally change our lives in one day. I accept the job, and we're off. Simon, Harley, and I, we talk for just a little while longer before we break for the day and before my team gets in. We go over some of the sketches he has of the work they did along the way, dates of milestones, and a little more about the team. There's no real project lead, which I found interesting, but that's because each piece that you know each member brings can become the most important thing at any given time. Each piece is crucial. He also shows me a picture of Luther, and we talk about a few things that he's been connected to in the past, showing me the nature of who this guy is. And I can assure you, he's dark. And really, that was it for day one. And when we hook up again, I have some of my team who I've briefed and I've shared everything with them so that I've received so far, so they're up to speed. Simon had the rest of his team there also. So we meet, you know, the priest, the physicist, the professor, and the medium. What a group. They're all put together. They're extremely focused. And aside from the slightly uncomfortable feeling that the medium gave us, the meeting went great. I mean, she was great too, but she just had a way of looking at you and, you know, with all the stuff that I've done and seen and that we've done together as a team, you just couldn't help but think that she saw a lot more about you than we could see. 
It was hard not to ask her about it, but we needed to stay just as focused as they were. And, you know, together they were an interesting group. And each person brought something unique to the table. With how delicate this whole thing was, I could see how they all needed to be there. And it was great to meet them, but we really needed to get going. We already knew that we're going to need to locate where Luther is now and who his top guys are in all of this. And we need to get to England to find out what, if anything, is going on there. And there's a rush, you know, that floods through all of us as we take in what we're dealing with. We have major world advancement with powers and abilities, some still undiscovered, and a man and a group immersed in the dark arts and full of the desire to change who we are in a very evil way. We know that there's no turning back now until this thing is done. Okay, so Ryder and Jagger head to England. They will sniff out what they can and track down the guys we're aware of over there so far, and they'll start with that. Harley and I will start scoping out Luther, and we go where we know to start, the house that he bought and stays at when he's in town. Anyway, this house is just outside of downtown Utrecht. There are buildings on either side of it that are made up of row homes, so already it's a bit out of place, you know, it's the only house there. And the other strange thing about it is that it's painted black, all black. And I could say that I have not ever seen a house quite like this before in person. It doesn't really look all that welcoming, I can tell you that. The bad thing for us, though, is that it is so close to these buildings on either side of it because... We'd like to be able to get to the windows or find some way to look inside to see what's going on. And it's not like we're just going to walk up to the front porch. So anyway, but right now we're just observing and we plan on being there for quite a bit, as long as it takes. But what happens is about 45 minutes in, we see Luther and another guy walk outside of the house. And they stand there and they talk and they smoke a cigarette and things. And then he turns to go back inside. But then he stops. And he turns back around and he looks down the street one way, then he looks the other way down by where we are, and then he looks up and he just starts smiling. I mean, he's got a pretty good grin on his face, like he's satisfied about something. Anyway, then he just chuckles, turns around and goes back inside. So I don't know what that little meeting was about, but he seems very happy about something. What I know is, is that we're going to have to find out what's going on inside that house. So we'll have to come back that night when we have better cover to do that. On our way back to meet the super team, we cruise through town, you know, to get a better idea of what that's all about. I mean, I've heard about Utrecht uh, and the research that goes on there, but I had no idea what the place really was like overall. We're not really that far from Amsterdam, actually. Anyway, we cruise around and we find it to be, you know, it's a quaint city with people biking everywhere. There's shops, cobbled squares, canals, and everybody looked happy. They looked good. All I could think of was too bad. They had no idea what was really going on right under their noses. Okay, when Harley and I return to town that night, it's like midnight and we come prepared for anything that we may have to do. I mean, knocking on the front door to get in or walking up to a window is pretty much out of the question here. From what we scoped out earlier, the front porch is where people come and go, so we want to avoid that. And we were hoping that we'd be able to see something from the back, but it turns out to be sort of a foyer entranceway area, and we can't really see anything. And then there's large bushes that fill up the space between the house and the buildings next to it. So we are going to have to go onto the roof and scale down, something we knew was possible, even though we hoped it would be a little easier than that, but so be it. So we find out where the window is that we want to see from, and it's on the side, but over by the front where the main living area we think is. Harley breaks out her hook rope, and that's just what the name is. It's a rope with a hook on the end, and we're able to throw it up and catch it on the chimney. We are way back by the side of the house, away from where any people are at this point. And after we climb down it when we're leaving, we're just going to throw it back up there and leave it on the roof. It's way in the back, and we're hoping that no one sees it, and they shouldn't see it in this time that we're there. I take out my cable ring, and what that is, is it's a metal ring, and inside of it is a coil. And while I'm up there, I'm able to fit the ring around one of the pipes that's sticking out. Harley's going to stay up top to keep an eye on things and help retract it if I need her to, but I sync it up to my computerized watch, and I should be able to control it myself. So I hook my foot into the ring at the end of that, and then with the push of a button, it lowers me down slowly down the side of the house. And when I get just to the side of that bigger window, 
I stop myself. And I lean over and I look inside and I see Luther standing in front of the fireplace. And there's a half circle of people sitting on the floor in front of him. I can hear a little bit of what he's saying. And he's telling them that he will be leaving in the morning and will not be back until the job is done. And that while he's gone, they need to prepare. They need to remember the rituals he taught them and do them in the order he told them. And then he pulls a candle off the mantle. And it's black, which seems to be his theme. He lights it, and then he sets it on the floor, and then he rises to stand again, and with his hands in the air, he starts chanting in a language I'm not familiar with, but I do hear him repeat Lucifer over and over again. And when he starts doing that, everyone on the floor puts their hands to their knees, and they bow their heads. And this goes on for a few minutes, and then a girl walks in, and she's in a red cloak. The hood of the cloak is down, and I can see that she has long black hair and very bright red lipstick. The others on the floor, you know, they look up now as this woman walks in and she walks up to Luther and plants a giant kiss on him. And whatever all that means, everyone at that point jumps to their feet and Luther cranks up the music. I mean, you could have fooled me if this didn't look like a celebration. I'm thinking, could they be farther along than anyone thought? I need to find out what Ryder and Jagger have found. I get my coil to wind back up, and it lifts me slowly, and I climb my way back to the top, and Harley and I are quickly out of there. And it was good timing, because it turns out that while we were doing all of that, a message came in from Ryder, and she tells me that they're onto something big, and that we need to check it out. She thinks the big day for Luther could be happening there, in Manchester. So when we get back to where we're staying, and that's now like 2.30 or 3 in the morning, or something like that. I pull her up on a video call so we can all have more of a face-to-face. And Ryder tells us that they were able to locate one of the men that Simon said was working with Luther. He has an odd name, but I'm going to go ahead and call him Lurch. He's tall, dark hair, dark eyes. He was very easy to recognize, but he was extremely hard to follow. It was like it was his protocol to constantly act as if someone was following him, whether anyone actually was or not. And then it was as if he would suddenly just disappear. Jagger staked him out, though, and it became clear why he seemed to disappear and why it was so hard for the super team to keep track of him. It appeared that Luther's clan had something going on down in the tunnels below the city. And here's how that all went. So Jagger and Ryder follow Lurch to Luther's bookshop, which, I mean, he worked for Luther, so this was not unusual. But what they observed that evening is that before he left to go to the apartment they had there for the night, they witnessed Lurch pulling one of the bookshelves aside. It was actually a doorway going to somewhere they didn't know yet. He came back up with a large black book. Then he stuck it in a bag he had out front, and then he left. And as soon as he was gone, Jagger and Ryder went in. Because while Luther was downstairs, they adjusted the shop door in such a way that it wouldn't actually fully lock and it took almost no effort for them to get inside when he was gone. They went in behind that bookcase, and what they found seemed to be part of the tunnel system there, except that it was all sealed off. There were different rooms and things, but you could see that someone bricked off certain walls more recently than when these tunnels were built. It was obvious they closed this place off so that no one could get in. In one of the smaller rooms that looked like an office-slash-museum, they also find cabinets covered up with black cloth. The main room was obviously where they did their rituals and ceremonies. There were jars of different things, candles, different symbols, including that large inverted pentacle, and it was carved into the floor. On the back wall of this room, there was a large velvet piece of red fabric that covered the entire wall. They looked behind it, and they found a metal door. The look of it reminded Ryder of a cremation chamber, but it reminded both of them of the pictures they had seen of Simon's device. So this was it. This was where they were going to do it. Well, they got out of there in a hurry to get the information back to us. Now, what they also did while Lurch was inside the bookstore was put a bug in his car. They could listen live, and it would record everything he said. So they checked into that to find out if there was, you know, anything interesting or useful. And what they found, what we'll all listen to at that point, is that while driving, Lurch actually calls Luther. Now, We can only hear one side of the conversation, but the gist of it seemed as though they were set up to meet, that Lurch would be there to pick Luther up, so he's flying in, and that they would get set up. He also gets a confirmation that the welcoming event is set to take place in one week, and at that time, 
the world will be forever changed as they welcome in their praised new leader. So, we have a lot to figure out here. We have no reason to think that this would be anything but the event to welcome the devil into our world. So that conference call took a while. We get like three hours of sleep or something, and bright and early at 7 a.m. the next morning, Harley and I meet up with Simon and his group at their lab. And with what we had to say, the meeting starts out kind of crazy, although the medium stays pretty quiet the whole time we talk. The physicist, you know, he's out of his mind. The priest is praying, and the professor is going over the different scenarios of what must be happening. And we get everyone to calm down so we can go over all of this. I mean, Harley and I need to get to Manchester, and we need to stake out the place and figure out when they come and go and find a good time to get in, take it all, and get out. And we have a week, so we should have plenty of time. Simon and the group do have some legitimate concerns, though. You know, how are they testing this? What are their safeguards? If they're successful, you know, what comes across? Can it be controlled? But they also know that there's a good chance that Luther will be sloppy and he'll make mistakes. But all it takes, you know, is one good opportunity for evil to get its chance to come through. And then who knows? You know, everyone's nerves are running wild on this one. I mean, I do the best I can to make them feel more settled, you know, with the fact that we're there. But then we waste no time in packing up everything we brought for this. And we head over to Manchester. So the travel takes a bit. And then, of course, we have to get settled. But remember, we do have Scarlett and Frankie back home. And they're helping us, too, in the background. They have a stakeout van ready for us. They have a car. They have our accommodations. So it's great. You know, once we're there, we can actually just settle in quickly and then get right to work. Jagger will start his watch on the bookstore with Harley while Ryder and I prepare to go in. I want to go in and see this all for myself and get prepared for what's going on. We have all our communications devices so we can stay in touch. And I mean, I'm ready. You know, this will be more of an informational trip to the underground so I can see what they're doing and I'm also going to plant some monitoring devices so we can keep an eye on things and listen to what they're doing. We find that Luther and a few of his cohorts are all down there that evening but when they leave Ryder and I go in just as Jagger and her did. It's definitely part of the tunnel system I can see that well it was it's something else now. We find the room with the file cabinets and the very first thing we do is put our equipment in there and then wow Ryder was right. That one room really was a small museum. It had a large black desk in it with a computer. The whole room was decorated in black and red, and there's dark art everywhere. They have a glass case full of little statues, you know, black ones with horns, animal legs, goat heads, masks, all the crazy stuff. And the walls had paintings of the man himself. Call him the Prince of Darkness, the Antichrist, Satan, Lucifer whatever your choice is, but he was everywhere. This room was no doubt Luther's. And then we find the gateway, and it was just as Jagger and Ryder described it. And then we nose our way around a little bit more, but once I get the monitoring equipment all set up where I hope they won't find it, the only thing I want to do is scope out a place to hide. We will need that if we want to be where the action is. Sure enough, one of the other smaller rooms, closed off with this black silk sheet, looks to just be storage. There are boxes stacked, robes, things like that. It's perfect. I move a few things around to make some room. I want it to be ready. And if that stuff is moved around again when we get back, we will know to be ready uh, for the fact that they might go in there more often than we'd like. So we want to be ready for that too. Okay, so we're in and then we're out. All's fine, right? We have six days at this point. Jagger and Ryder watched him on the first day and recorded what times he went in and came out. He basically just broke for lunch and stayed into the evening. And if he does the same tomorrow, we will consider this a pattern and we'll use it the next day. And we will go in and we will wait for him. We'll take him out while he's in there and anyone else that's in there with a sleep gas that we'll pump into the chamber. You know, if he's supposedly supposed to be down there, his people won't really be looking for him. So that works out great. And then while they're out, which they will be for a good two hours, we will take all that we came for. That leaves us three days to spare before they would use their gateway. The next day, we find the pattern to be true, at least to the extent of what we need. So the next morning, I get there early, and again, I take Ryder with me. I want to get in before he gets there, and I want to check out what he's been up to. And then when he leaves for lunch, I want to dig around his computer for a while and see what's going on there. And that all goes fine, and it's great because I can even get into his phone through the storage app he uses on both devices. 
What's not great, though, is that I find he's moved up the date. He's doing some kind of test run with the hopes that it's successful, and he's doing it that day. And picture this, okay, because Ryder and I are down there, and by the time we get in and get all this information, Luther's coming back for the afternoon. If he and his crew do not leave at some point before they plan on doing this, we need to figure out how we're going to get our stuff down there while they're down there so we can stop this thing from happening. So this went from something we had time to do and control over to the complete opposite. And unfortunately, that happens on jobs. So for now, Ryder and I are stuck in the storage room, but we are in contact with Harley and Jagger, who are standing by, and they have everything we need. So the main rooms we're worried about, just so you can picture this, are what I call the landing pad. It's just the small room that you land in when you get down there. It's a small space. And to the left is a hallway, and down the hallway is the main, bigger meeting room. It's a pretty good size. And then down a ways from that, that's where the storage room is. That's where I am. Luther's out there preaching about how he just couldn't wait and how he was too excited. And it came to him that he didn't have to wait. He thought they were ready. They had done the work, and there was no reason to wait. And I'm listening to all of this, and I mean, I'm just dying to see what's going on, but I can't go out and risk it. But then the lights go out. Seems like Jagger was successful in cutting the power. These guys aren't even phased by it, though. They're so excited for one thing, and since they seem to have every single candle in the place lit, they seem to be fine. And now it's our time. Jagger stays up top to be our eyes on the ground out there, and Harley starts to make her way in. We were going to store all the stuff in the storage room with us as we waited for the scheduled day, but now we're going to the landing pad to meet Harley, and we'll have to set it all in motion from there. So Ryder and I sneak behind the group of people. They're all in robes, and Luther's just up there with his arms in the air, his eyes are closed, so we actually make it just fine. When Harley gets down, we sort of hunker down behind the small stairway there, and we break out what she's got. She only has one pack. We don't need much. There's a machine inside that pack, and it's full of the gas that we need to fill up the main room. We have a hose that we attach, and we'll just put it in there, and it'll pump it all in there. This pack is also equipped with five face masks. They look like doctor masks that they would put on during surgery, but it's fit with a small nose clamp and a tube on the inside. So it closes your nostrils, and then you put your mouth to the small tube, like a straw, and a small piece of it breaks through the other side of the mask to the outside. And this little tube is specially equipped to filter almost any air that is sucked in through it, but it only lasts for a few minutes. The sleep gas we brought is a quick dissolve, so you, you know if you can somehow avoid it hitting you, it will disappear in less than two minutes, and you'd be fine. But I mean, unless these guys have little masks of their own, they're not going to be anywhere to hide in that room. So anyway, we get all that set up, and then we crouch down a bit, and we make it back over to the main room where Luther's just been preaching and chanting. But when we get there, it seems he's been busy doing other things too. He has the door to the gateway opened. There are puffs of smoke coming out of this thing, and the inside's shaped like a circle. It's like a tube. And there's a ring around the outside of it, and it's lit up in fluorescent green. And everyone, including Luther, is looking into this thing. He's saying some kind of prayer or something, and his hands are reaching for the inside. And you know, now we're standing upright, and we're looking directly into this thing too, from just behind the small group of robes, and I can see these dark, ghost-like hands reaching up and out. And Luther was looking for evil, remember, and it makes me wonder, what souls are those that want out? But then I see something else, a set of very red eyes on what seems to be a large black figure. When that shows up, everyone takes a step back, and even Luther stops. And then the loudest growl I have ever heard comes from that tube, and a gust of wind shoots out of it too. And this was all happening within seconds. You know, I grab Harley's arm, we put our masks to our faces, and she shoots off that gas. I mean, we got this just in time. Everyone instantly falls to the floor. Ryder runs up and slams the gateway door shut, and engages the clamps around it to keep it that way. I call on Jagger, who comes down with another pack. And the first thing we do is open up the control center for the gateway, and he stuffs it with putty and explosives. And this thing gets blown to pieces. But, you know, we have to make sure this thing is really shut down. So we're hesitant, but we open the gateway door. And the four of us, you know, we're just staring at this thing. But when it's opened, there's nothing now. 
the connection was lost. It just looks like a cylinder now. But, you know, we didn't build this thing, and we have to think that there's more to this than it looks like. The whole thing has to be destroyed, and Jagger takes care of that. And then we all start moving things out. We get the file cabinets. We find the two towers in the storage room and take those. We take all USBs and notebooks from Luther's desk. We wipe them clean basically of anything that looks like it would even have the tiniest chance of being gateway related. We all do one more final look over of the gateway and it's destroyed. There's nothing left of it. The handle to the square door blew off and is sitting on the floor. So I do take that. That's for Simon and the crew. Then I take photos and we're out of there. I mean, we just made it. And it would have been great to stick around and see the look on Luther's face when he woke up. I mean, he thought he had this thing beat. And a few seconds later, and he might have, but he didn't expect us. He was looking for the super team guys, and he thought he had shaken them. When we get back to the Netherlands, which we do as fast as possible, we find a very relieved group. You know, Jagger kept them updated from above while we were in there, and then I called Simon when we left. But I'm sure they were just going nuts while having to wait. It was a good day, though, when we brought them back all of their stuff, and then some. And just flipping through some of Luther's notebooks that I brought back, I mean, the professor was saying that it looked like Luther had big plans, big hopes and dreams for when the big man came. But we were able to stop all of that. And so it was. Our job was done. We all sat around that last night, and we ate and told stories. I gave them that door handle. And the mood, you know, was just much lighter than when we got there. And that was a good thing. They could go on with their work and their own studies and research. Things that when we said our goodbyes, I was positive I would hear about again from them. You know, about what exactly, I didn't know yet. But I was pretty sure they'd need something in the future. And that was my job, caught in the middle between angels and demons, in a world where we can only hope that the work we do and the advancements we make as people make a difference in the right direction, in the right way. And it's amazing when you really think about it, how fast it all could change. I hope you enjoyed this vlog, and I hope you check back for more. And subscribe so you know when I'm posting next. Believe me, I have a lot of stories to tell. And thank you for listening. And until next time. And I will talk to you all soon.